Over 5,000 years ago, high in the unforgiving chill of the Tyrolean Alps, a man died alone, his clothing layered with purpose, his flesh still bearing the wound of an arrow to the back. We called him Odsi, and for decades, scientists believed he represented a typical man of Europe's Copper Age. They examined his stomach contents, his leather shoes, even the parasites in his gut. His story seemed told until now as a new DNA study reveals something no one expected. Utsi didn't belong. His genes didn't match those of the people who should have been his family, his neighbors, or even his tribe. His ancestry points to a fading lineage that may have already been disappearing while he still walked the mountain trails. So the real question isn't how he died, it's who he was and why he was so utterly different from the people around him. Before we unfreeze the secrets of this ancient mystery, what's your theory? Was Otsi a survivor of a lost group, a traveler, an exile? Let us know in the comments. And hit subscribe for more deep dives into prehistoric DNA, ancient migrations, and the forgotten threads of human history right here on Stone and Bone. When Otsi was first discovered melting out of the ice in 1991, he was mistaken for a lost hiker. It wasn't until scientists dated his remains that the true shock set in. This wasn't a modern mountaineer. This was a man who had walked the Alps during the Copper Age, over 5,000 years ago. Suddenly, the world had a pristine prehistoric time capsule. He wore layered clothing stitched from goat and deer hides, a cloak made of woven grass, and shoes stuffed with hay for insulation. He carried a flint dagger, a longbow, and most famously, a copper axe with a wooden haft still intact. His body bore signs of arthritis, frostbite, whipworm parasites, and even the earliest known case of Lyme disease. His last meal, a high protein blend of wild ibex, red deer, and einkorn wheat, food sourced from all over the Alpine environment, suggesting he was both a hunter and part of an agricultural community. And then there was his violent death, an arrowhead lodged in his left shoulder, a fatal wound to the skull, and signs he may have fallen from a height. Everything about him seemed to fit the life of a well-equipped Copper Age European, making his way through the high passes. A man of his time, caught in a deadly confrontation. But there was one assumption everyone made without question, that Otzi was typical of the people who lived around him, that he belonged, and it turns out, that may have been the biggest mistake of all. In 2023, scientists from the Institute for Mummy Studies in Bolzano, Italy, set out to answer a long-ignored question. Was Otzi really one of the local people? Instead of just analyzing Otzi alone, they turned their focus outward toward his world, his neighbors, his possible kin. They examined ancient DNA from 47 individuals who lived in the South Tyrolean Alps, between 6,400 and 1,300 BC. Among these were 15 people who lived during Otzi's time, roughly 3,300 BC, deep in the Copper Age. By comparing Otzi's genome to theirs, researchers hoped to see whether he was genetically average for his time and place, or whether he was an outlier hiding in plain sight. At first glance, the results lined up. Like the other Copper Age inhabitants of the Alps, Otzi carried a high percentage of Anatolian farmer ancestry, about 90%, with the rest coming from ancient European hunter-gatherers. This made sense. After all, around 7,000 years ago, farmers from Anatolia had brought agriculture into Europe, blending with native populations. By 4,800 BC, people living in the Alps had largely stabilized into a unique genetic community. But then researchers zoomed in on lineages. The specific family lines passed down through paternal Y chromosomes and maternal mitochondrial DNA. And here, things took an unexpected turn. Otzi's paternal lineage, the DNA passed from father to son, was a rare branch of the G2A haplogroup called G2AZ 6208. It had only been found in a handful of Neolithic skeletons from France, Spain, Germany, and Croatia. The other 15 Copper Age men from the Alps, 
They all carry G2AL497, a much more common and widespread lineage found throughout early European farming communities. That wasn't all. Oatsy's mitochondrial DNA, which is passed down from mother to child, belong to a group called K1F. And this particular variant has never been found in any other ancient or modern human being. Not in Europe, not in the Near East, not even in the thousands of samples collected from across Eurasia. This means Oatsy's maternal lineage may have vanished completely from the human gene pool, a genetic ghost. So while he looked like a typical Copper Age farmer on the surface, his bloodlines told a different story. One of isolation, disappearance, or perhaps even migration. Oatsy, it seemed, was not a reflection of the Alpine population, but a departure from it. Beyond ancestry, Oatsy's DNA revealed stunning details about how he lived, what he ate, how he looked, and how far his community reached. Let's start with appearance. Genetically, Oatsy likely had dark brown to black hair and brown eyes, features common among early European farmers descended from Anatolian migrants. His skin tone remains debated. Early reconstructions painted him as darker skinned, while more recent DNA models suggest a lighter, intermediate complexion. But one thing's clear, he didn't match the stereotypical image of a pale, blonde European often associated with ancient populations. In fact, Oatsy had one genetic trait that set him apart from most modern Europeans. He was lactose intolerant. He lacked the gene that allows adults to digest milk. While today many Europeans can consume dairy without issue, this adaptation only became common after the Bronze Age likely due to heavy reliance on milk in later pastoral societies. Hunsi's people hadn't made that shift yet. Dairy simply wasn't on the menu. So what was? His final meal provides clues. Ibex meat, red deer, inkhorn wheat, and even bracken fern, a mix of hunted game, cultivated grains, and foraged plants. It was a rugged alpine diet optimized for survival in cold, steep terrain. And he didn't just eat off the land, he traveled through it. His possessions tell us more than his stomach ever could. That copper axe. The metal came from modern-day Tuscany, hundreds of miles away. Obsidian flakes in his toolkit likely originated from the Mediterranean island of Lipari and amber beads from the region point toward Baltic trade networks. Even isolated highland communities, it turns out, were woven into continent-spanning exchange systems. And yet, the most telling part of Oatsy's life wasn't what he carried. It was what didn't carry on after him. Oatsy lived during a time when the Alps weren't just wilderness. They were home to tight-knit farming villages and extended family groups. These highland communities had adapted to the challenging environment, passing down land, livestock and identity through generations. And genetic evidence shows that their society was patrilocal, a system where men stayed in their home villages and women married in from elsewhere. The proof? The men buried across the region all shared a similar Y chromosome lineage, G2 AL497. It shows they likely descended from the same male ancestors, generation after generation, without much movement. This would have preserved family land, power, and tradition within a clan-like system. But the women, their mitochondrial DNA was a rainbow of diversity. He, J, K, U, V, X, sometimes rare subtypes like H, 3, K, or J, 1, C, 12, B. This suggests women came from various places to marry into these villages, creating alliances and spreading cultural practices through family ties. Oatsy's mitochondrial DNA, K1F, doesn't show up in any of them, and neither does his Y chromosome. That's the twist. In a region where nearly every man shared a genetic thread, Oatsy didn't. He was the genetic outsider in a closed circle society. It's possible that Oatsy wasn't born there. Perhaps he came from a distant valley, a mountain pass, or a culturally similar but genetically separate group, one that eventually disappeared. Or he could have been part of a marginal community, never fully accepted into the local structure. In ancient societies, where bloodline and belonging were closely linked, 
that kind of difference mattered. And in some cases, it could be fatal. Otzi died sometime around Dry Thousand, Dry Hundred BC. For centuries after, the Alpine communities around him continued their quiet high altitude existence. But beginning around 2400 BC, everything changed. New people arrived, migrants from the vast Pontic Caspian steppe, a region stretching from modern Ukraine to Kazakhstan. They brought horses, wheeled carts, bronze tools, and completely different DNA. This wasn't a small influence, it was a genetic wave. Alpine remains from this era, like individuals labeled L01 and V01, carry up to 30% steppe ancestry. Some also show traces from even farther east, the Caucasus and the Iranian Neolithic, hinting at long-distance migration and trade networks threading into the mountains. The impact? Profound. The once stable Anatolian farmer genome that had dominated the Alps for thousands of years began to shift. Within a few centuries, the gene pool changed so dramatically that Otzi's genetic signature disappears completely from the archaeological record. He was gone, not just in death, but in lineage. No living person carries his unique maternal DNA. His paternal line, G2AZ6208, becomes increasingly rare. It's as if the people Otzi belonged to were slowly erased, first culturally, then biologically. And that raises a powerful possibility. Otzi wasn't just an unlucky traveler. He might have been a relic of a vanishing people, a human time capsule, preserved not just in ice, but in genetic isolation, moments before the Bronze Age Revolution swept it all away. We often think of Otzi as a representative of his time, a man who walked the same paths, ate the same food, and died like others in the Copper Age Alps. But the deeper we peer into his genes, the clearer it becomes. He wasn't like the others. He was the last of something. A man whose Y DNA was already fading from the gene pool. A maternal line that left no trace on Earth after him. A body, alone in the high mountains, preserved by coincidence, but perhaps also by fate. His death, violent, sudden, and solitary, may have been more than just bad luck. It may have been the end of a bloodline. The final note of a song that no longer echoes in the human genome. We don't know if he was an outcast, a traitor from a distant valley, a political exile, or simply a man in the wrong place at the wrong time. But we do know this. When we look at Otzi, we're not just looking at the past. We're looking at something that no longer exists. And that makes him one of the most haunting discoveries in human history. Not just because he was preserved in ice, but because he was preserved alone. New genetic studies are being published every year. Each new ancient genome brings new surprises, overturning everything we thought we knew. And as more alpine remains are tested, we may finally learn who Otzi really was, where his people came from, and why they disappeared. Do you think Otzi was a relic of an extinct people, or just a lone traveler caught in the winds of change?